In this part three of our cooling tower explanation, we're going to be talking a little bit about capacity, capacity control, and our primary portion is how to deal with sedimentation and other contaminants in the water. Keeping a clean cooling tower is very important for a variety of reasons. It can affect health efficiency and a whole bunch and actual mechanical stability as well. Um, a poorly maintained cooling tower will fail earlier than a non than a maintained cooling tower. So the the biggest thing is we have to maintain our water temperatures under 85 degrees, but not too far under 85 degrees. Okay, so for a centrifugal chiller, we need to maintain water temperature around 70 degrees. Screw chiller, same way. Reciprocating skiller, 70 degrees. Absorption chiller needs to be out at 85 degrees water. Okay, the operator's job is to maintain the condenser water temperature between 70 and 85 degrees when the load varies between 15 and 100%. The temperature varies from 10 degrees Fahrenheit to 80 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb. And you need to be able to use a minimum energy. You do need to maintain temperatures while sequencing chillers, pumps, and cooling towers. You need to avoid frequent fan cycling. In other words, we don't want the fans on the towers to be coming on and off too much. We need to maintain a minimal size maintenance crew. and if you happen to be from the northern part of the country, you must also prevent freezing of the water. So how do we manage the performance of a cooling tower? Do we use air management or do we use water management? Both are possible. Air management equals capacity control. The cooling tower capacity is directly proportional to airflow. More airflow, more capacity. So. The other way to do it is maintain, we want to maintain full water flow to the tower. That allows air side capacity control mechanisms to work properly, resulting in better tower control and more stable operating conditions for the chillers. What can happen if the tower is controlled by water flow? This is another way that some people are attempting to do this. Reduced water flow may result in uneven distribution of water throughout the wet deck. Okay, the spray heads at the top or the dam that's at the top could not have enough water to produce even flow. This reduces thermal efficiency, increases scale buildup, increases the potential carryover and drift, that's the loss of water from the tower, increases potential for motor overload, and increases potential icing in the winter in the north. So. The best method of cooling tower capacity control is on the air side, using variable frequency drives, two-speed motors, and fan cycling, no more than six cycles per hour. In other words, we might have a temperature swing of that water in the tower, but we do not want to in we don't want to cycle the fans on and off more than six times per hour. The motors will eventually wear out. Now there is some popularity of variable variable frequency drives on pumps, okay? Um, in induced draft cross-flow towers, maybe. The manufacturer's type of these towers, specifically BAC, BAC, and Marley, have provided different forms of variable water condition controls over the years, including low water dams and low flow nozzle, nozzles. Okay, so this is an induced draft flow tower. You see actually the dams on the left side here where everything flows down into the nozzles that have the spinner to spread the water on it. Okay, force draft counterflow towers, not yet on the variable frequency drives on the pumps, but possibly soon. Because these tower spray distribution are designed as pressurized headers, there's no way to properly control low flow rates and should not be considered as good candidates for water flow VFDs. When you have multiple towers, chillers and pumps for winter operation, one chiller, one pump equals one tower or cell. Use automatic valves on the inlets, outlet, and equalizers. Don't over control. Three to four steps at a maximum. 
and then it's then you have to stop wait and see what happens there are several life reducing conditions that you find in cooling towers first of all is contaminant fouling sand grit scale rust etc you can have chemical imbalances you can have lack of maintenance and you can have corrosion this is some examples of things that can be found in the tower in a tower system fouled out water treatment system was the top settled in the tower basin required shoveling then you have excessive cartridge replacements and you have plug spray nozzles note that looks like rust and iron buildup so some of the contaminants that come in is through airborne solids in other words things that are in the air that are being pulled into the tower along with the air those will contaminate the water and will actually settle at the bottom another source of these contaminants is the makeup water with cooling towers we need to regularly make up the water that evaporates off because we deal with evaporative cooling so the makeup water brings a lot of contaminants into the system and again down at the bottom you'll see that as sediments you'll see uh, the minerals that are part of the makeup water will actually um, not evaporate out and will become part of the entire system so there are some guidelines for solids accumulations okay for solid load you can't have over five parts per million okay and a so that's the ASHRAE standard. So let's say we have a 250 ton tower and we have 700 gallons per minute, 2,000 operating hours per year, that's approximately 40 hours per week. In that tower, we're going to have 105,000 cubic inches of solids that accumulate over the year. That's five inches deep in the tower basin. And this is just an example picture of here's one example of what the tower accumulation can look like and another example <coughs> when you start to see this be type of condition in a cooling tower it comes down to having to come in remove by shoveling the accumulation there's another problem accumulation of solids in the bottom breeds bacteria growth okay and contaminates the water water then mixes with the air because that's what we do okay we have air coming in we have air coming out we mix it with water to create that evaporative cooling and then the air can actually become contaminated that comes out of that tower we have several types of bacteria that can be found in a typical cooling tower. Legionella, tuberculosis, whooping cough, strep pneumonia, staph pneumonia. All of these things can breed in the cooling towers. It has been confirmed that these problems can be associated with the same source, building cooling towers. The problem is recognized by others, most notably ASHRAE which has gone so far to publish guidelines for controlling problems in cooling towers. We have to keep cooling tower exhaust away from the building air intake. In other words, the exhaust of the cooling tower is not air that we want to breathe right away and pull back into a fresh air intake of a building. We want to use effective biocides. We need to treat that water. We want um, technicians to wear protective devices when cleaning or working in a tower. We want to keep suspended solids and organics out of cooling water loops. Okay, one of the problems is that the uh, solids cause fouling in the chiller barrels. Okay, this is the side of a um, chiller barrel with the top covers off, and you see all the little tubes. You see the buildup at the bottom of the tubes. Every bit of buildup reduces water flow. This is just another example of a plate chiller that's been taken apart and you can actually see the clean one on the left and the fouled up one on the right. That's all contamination that came in through the cooling tower loop. And here's just a closer view. It's easy to see that keeping the system free of these unwanted contaminants is much more than just convenience. It's necessity. These will eventually clog up and cause massive system problems. 
Lastly, the tower itself suffers from the contaminants accumulating within the fill. Basically, there are three, there are five approaches to ridding a system of these contaminants. They're not interchangeable, but they each address a different kind of problems. In other words, all of these have to be used. We use full stream. We do not reduce the water flow. We use makeup water. We use side stream and we clean the basin on occasion. Okay, full stream protection. Okay, we do not reduce water flow. Side stream. Okay, sometimes we actually, if we don't need enough water flow, we can add an extra pipe to the pumping system and we can pull in and maintain a little bit more water flow that way. Basin sweeper systems is another possibility. We pump, and I'll show you a better picture of this, okay? We pump water in and we actually push the solids off that basin and then filter it out. This is an example of a sweeper system. There's an extra pump at the bottom of the cooling tower and we blast water through nozzles to blast that solid off of the bottom and then we capture it and filter it out. And this is just an example of the nozzle used in such a filter system. And a good picture of this system like this, okay? We have the nozzles all at the bottom, and they're actually pushing water around to keep the solids off of the bottom. Notice the water surface indicative of controlled turbulence created by the hydro boosters. That's a, that's a trade name, hydro boosters. So what kind of filtering do we use? We have cartridge filters, we have sand filters, we have strainers, we have screens, and we have separators. Screens, bags, and cartridges, unless there's larger contamination in the fluid, which can block or blind a barrier filter more quickly, leading to excessive pressure loss and cleaning or replacement routines. They're very effective. The sand filter is more like what you find in a swimming pool. A sand filter relies on a given bed of coarse sand media to ca capture the contaminants in its upper surface. And then just like with a swimming pool, to clean that filter out, you back flush the sand or replace it. So here's the backwash procedure. Normal flow is in that way. Then we open a reversing valve manually and we back wash the process. And it pulls all the contaminants off the top of the sand and pushes it out a bypass at the top. We can also use um, a centrifugal action separator for um, settable solids. In other words, if the solid will settle easily, flows induced in the upper entry and accelerates into the separation barrel, it removes the heavy solids from the liquid. The outward centrifugal action creates a low pressure vortex in the center of the barrel, leading to the outlet pipe through the top of the unit. Separated solids may periodically be purged with an automatic valve or continuously purged into a solid recovery vessel, returning all purged liquid back to the system flow. Okay, centrifugal acid action. You know that if you spin something, centrifugal force will pull the heavier objects outwards. That's what we're doing with the solids. The solids are going to be heavier than water. So for filtration selection, Okay, you have to look at the particles, particle size removal, flow range, the pressure loss, the maintenance requirements, the liquid loss, how are the solids handled, the space requirements, and engineering and technical support. So we've talked a little bit about water flow, the importance of water flow, and we've also talked about some of the maintenance that's required and some of the filtering that's required. Again, the cleaner you can keep a cooling tower, the better off the entire system will work because the contaminants in a cooling tower, A, are bad for people's health. We don't want to breathe the stuff. We don't want to pull it back into the air. And B, we need the solids out so that it doesn't foul up the chiller barrels and cause efficiency and tube blockage issues.